This is the lecture for Monday, March 16th. Today we're going to continue our discussion of the weak interactions. So we left off uh, last time talking about beta decay transitions. Um, and we had said there was a piece coming from the vector part, the Fermi interaction. And then we have a part coming from the axial vector part, the gamma of Teller part of the interaction. So now we're going to talk about the, uh, the structure of these amplitudes that we can get. So suppose we have a, an initial state, a nucleus, with uh, spin j, spin j, z component of, j, of, of spin m, and uh, the uh, isospin t, and the z component of isospin t0. These are all the initials of uh, state. Uh, indices and you have the corresponding ones for the final state. Then we can write down a, a very simple uh, factor coming from just the, the isospin. And then uh, there are some various uh, rules that we get for the, the, trans the Fermi transitions. Okay. First of all, for the Fermi transitions, those are these guys here. It's, it's very simple because these are simply the uh, the, the Pauli matrices for isospin. And so we find that the, the initial uh, spin j must be equal to the final spin j. We find that the, uh, the, the t initial and the t final must be equal. However, they cannot equal 0. That's simply because the, the operator that makes the transition has some non-zero isospin, so 0 to 0 is not allowed. Now, we also have that the, the z component, or the, what's labeled here as t0, for the final must be equal to t0 for the initial plus or minus 1. That's simply because of the fact that um, we're converting the, the pr pr uh, neutron to a proton, or vice versa. So delta t0 is equal to 1. The z component of the isospin changes by, by 1. Um, also, there is no change in the parity for the Fermi transition. Now, for the gamma teller transition, it's a bit more complicated because we have these spin operators for the for the nucleons as well. And in that case, the the change in this there's going to be some change in the spin, um, so it can be either zero or one. Now, because these guys have some non-zero spin to them, it's not possible to start in zero and end up in zero. So j 0 to 0 is forbidden. Now, uh, for the isospin, the, 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 change in the, the, the change in the isospin can be 0 or 1. And once again, because the operator has some non-trivial isospin uh, coming from these guys, there's no uh, possibility to, stick to, to, stay, uh, to start in uh, isospin 0 and end up in isospin 0. And similarly, uh, for the uh, similar to what we had for the Fermi transitions, the the change in the z component of isospin. By the way, if, if you're a little confused what I mean by the z component of isospin, meaning whether it's a proton or a neutron, um, that must change by plus or minus one. Okay. Now, the also for the gamma teller transitions, the change in the parity uh, is zero. It remains the same. So when you calculate the uh, the ft, uh, remember this f is the the, the integrated Fermi function and t is the, the half-life. Um, this is equal to some constant, which you, you have some factors that you have to count for putting here, divided by the, um, the amplitude squared for uh, the Fermi transition plus the amplitude squared coming from the gamma of Teller transition, and we've explicitly pulled out a factor of GA that's coming here. And in general, the transitions for uh, the, these amplitudes for the gamma teller matrix elements are generally smaller than that for the Fermi transitions when they're allowed. Okay, now we're going to talk about the, nu nu the neutrino in, in more detail. Now, shortly after uh, the Fermi theory of beta decay was, was developed, um, there's this very uh, astute observation by beta and, and piles um, that show the possibility of having the inverse of beta decay. That is something like this, where the proton plus an anti-electron neutrino goes to a neutron plus a positron. 
So that can happen, uh, for example, with the nucleus, where we have the anti-electron neutrino hit a proton in the nucleus, and then we have an, an extra neutron being produced, and the proton, obviously the proton just converts to a neutron, and then we have an, a, a positron, or we can have a neutrino and have then the, the neutron convert to a, a proton, and then we can have uh, an electron. You know, the difficulty with neutrinos, though, is that the cross-section, the essentially the effective size of, of the target as seen by the, the neutrino, measuring how strong they would like to, how strong they like, how strong is their interaction with matter. Um, this cross-section, the effective collision area, if you have an energy of, of something like four or five or ten times the uh, the rest energy of, of, the, of the electron, of MEC squared, okay, that's on the order of a few mega electron volts, or hundreds, uh, well, um, a, a few mega electron volts here, um, then uh, the cross section is actually really, really tiny. It's 10 to the minus 44 centimeters squared. Um, that may not be obvious uh, that that's really small because a lot of these numbers tend to be very tiny. but uh, one way to think about it is the mean free path. That is, if we have some density of nucleons as being n, then the mean free path is 1 over n times this cross section. And that gives us a length. It's essentially um, how far uh, the, nu the neutrinos go before hitting something. Okay? So the density, uh, the higher the density, the, the, the shorter the mean free path. The higher the cross section, the shorter the mean free path. So if we have uh, water, that's usually what we use for a detector of neutrinos, we have that the neutrinos actually go uh, about 3 times 10 to the 22 meters. Okay, that's an absurdly large distance. So neutrinos will pass through tens of the 22, 3 times 10 to the 22 meters of water before it hits something. So that corresponds with about 300 light years. Just imagine that having three, uh, a pool of water that's 300 light years in, let's say, in, in, in length, and then the neutrinos can essentially just pass right through that, well, with a probability of maybe of a half of, of, of hitting something um, in, in that uh, pool of water. So anyways, um, however, you can still see these interactions if you have a huge flux of neutrinos coming out. So Fred Rines and Clyde Cowan in 1951 uh, set about to try to detect neutrinos um, they realized that a nu nuclear reactor has a flux on the order of about 10 to the 13th anti-neutrinos, anti-electron neutrinos, per square centimeter per second. And so they started trying to look at this at the Hanford uh, nuclear reactor in, in uh, Washington, in the state of Washington, in 1953. However, they found that they, they weren't doing too well because there was actually a large background um, that was coming from cosmic rays, um, showers of charged particles coming down, and, and hitting the atmosphere, which made cascades of particles um, that, that would then be uh, seen uh, by their detectors even when the, um, the reactor was turned off. So they moved then to another nuclear reactor in South Carolina called Savannah River in 1955. And this facility actually had a well-shielded uh, shielded location that could shield from the, uh, the cosmic rays. Um, so they then uh, were about 11 meters from the reactor center and about 12 meters underground, all right? And so they, they, they used the target was water, uh, and, and so they had some cadmium chloride to dissolve in it. And then they were able to see then these neutrinos, they would hit the, uh, the protons in, in the water, okay? And they would produce then uh, events where the proton would be, uh, the anti-neutrino would hit the proton and give you the neutrino, uh, I'm sorry, the neutron plus the positron. And so they were able to see a signal rate of about three events per hour, and then this was the birth of the experimental neutrino physics. Now they, um, so unfortunately, Claude Cowan died in 1974, and sort of a, 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 a sad uh, aspect of the Nobel Prize is that you can't give to somebody who's passed away posthumously. And so uh, Fred Ryan's got the Nobel Prize in 1995. Uh, he got it jointly with Martin Pearl, who uh, did something else that was related to something similar, but uh, relating to the tau lepton. Now, there is also a very interesting story about neutrinos and the fact that they oscillate. 
into each other. Just like I told you with the weak interactions that um, there's this mixing up of the weak eigenstates with the mass eigenstates, right? They don't, they're not exactly aligned with each other. The same thing will happen with mass eigenstates, uh, sorry, the mass eigenstates and the flavor eigenstates with the weak uh, eigenstates of the neutron, n neutrinos. Um, there's a matrix here. Last time we called it this Kobayashi, the Vivo Kobayashi and Scow matrix, CKM, CKM matrix. This matrix is called the Pontecorvo, Corvo, Maki, Nakagawa, Sakata, PM and S matrix. Um, I should mention that uh, it, it was originally thought that all the neutrinos had zero mass completely, and so then this sort of mixing would, would not, uh, all these effects would not be uh, important. However, um, there was, there was, um, I'll tell you the, the story later after I tell you the, 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 uh, the physics of the neutrino oscillations. Um, I should mention then that, that the, this matrix is again parameterized in terms of mixing angles as well as some complex phases just like the CKM matrix was. So the point is, is that you can uh, produce then a, a neutrino with a given flavor and then you can, and then because it oscillates, uh, because the mass eigenstates are different from the flavor, os uh, flavor eigenstates or the weak interaction eigenstates, um, you might detect a different flavor of neutrino over here in the detector. And what happens is it oscillates as a function of distance or as a function of time, if you want. And you can actually see this probability having these interesting oscillations of, of because you have three different types of neutrinos mixing with each other. The characteristic of this probability is that we have some uh, mixing angle dependence here as well as an oscillation. And the oscillation uh, is, is a function of the distance that you travel. Uh, this is called the baseline. Uh, L is the baseline. And the, what characterizes the, uh, the oscillations is the difference in the mass squares of the neutrinos, mi squared minus mj squared, where these are different masses, neutrino masses. Um, and E is then just the energy of the neutrino. So you can see, if you put in, put in numbers here, it's about 1.27. If you have delta me squared, which uh, is measured in EV squared, um, typically it's somewhere around uh, uh, electron volts-ish. And uh, if you measure uh, L in, in uh, kilometers, and you measure E in GV, which is a, a good scale, then you, you get oscillations um, like this, sine squared of 1.27 times this part. Now, here are some um, neutrino uh, experiments. Uh, for example, to, to measure solar neutrinos, PP goes to D to the deuteron plus uh, positron plus electron neutrino. There is um, some historically there was the, the, uh, the these observations in the Homestake mine. Uh, this is a famous experiment uh, by Ray Davis where he, he actually detected that there was uh, a so, so there was a solar model of exactly how uh, this PP fusion process was happening. But uh, Ray Davis, who won the Nobel Prize a, a few years back, had these pioneering experiments where he was measuring these solar neutrinos. But he actually found that there was, uh, this was called the solar neutrino problem. He found that the, the flux of solar neutrinos was way different from, from what was predicted from the solar model, the nuclear physics of the, the burning of, of, of uh, the, the fusion process in the sun. And he, he, he said this really quite a long time ago, but a lot of people actually didn't believe it because they, they, they thought that perhaps the solar model was, was wrong. But, um, but, but now we, we realize that he was right, and, and there was there's some new physics involved, and that there was this was explained by the neutrino oscillations that these new, these electron neutrinos were converting into muon and tau neutrinos, and that's why his detector was not picking them up. Um, now there's also for these solar neutrinos there are experiments in Japan, uh, kamikande or super kamikande now, uh, that confirms the disappearance of solar neutrinos, and. Uh, this also has become a Nobel Prize, uh, as well as in, in Sudbury, uh, Ontario, uh, the Snow of Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, uh, observatory uh, um, in, in Canada, where they, um, where they do, do the same thing. They, they're measuring solar neutrinos. Then you can also measure atmospheric neutrinos um, coming not directly from, from the sun, but from the atmosphere. And this is also detected in Sukhumkhande, and they're looking for oscillations. You can also use accelerators to produce neutrinos by, by some accelerator 
uh, collisions that produce neutrinos. Um, and so there's several of them. There's, uh, there's a famous or infamous one where we have LS and D that, that actually had a very strange, um, uh, a, a much disputed um, uh, observation that hinted perhaps at, a, at a, another generation or a, a, some sterile neutrinos, but, but this has not been confirmed by other um, experiments, Carmen and Miniboom. Um, then there's the K2K, which is, uh, which is again, related to Kamikande here, but this, this is evolving and accelerated in Japan, um, where they, they, they measure then the, the, the disappearance of the flux of, of neutrinos. What they do is they have a detector that's near the accelerator and a detector that's far away from the accelerator, and then they can see that there's a difference between the two. And there's also then an ex experiment in Minos, um, which is doing very much the same thing. And then there's reactor experiments, which is involving nuclear reactors on places like Kamlan in Japan and Chu's uh, in, in, in China. Okay. No, so sorry. So this, this was in Europe. Um, the, the one in China is called Dai Bay. Okay. Now, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Super Kamekande. This is what the neutrino detectors look like because, as I mentioned, the, e the neutrinos don't like to interact with anything. So you need a whole lot of, of something. And so you have a whole lot of water. Um, and the, the reason that water is, is very useful is, is, first of all, it's plentiful. Um, and it it's also allows you to, uh, to do a Trenkov detection because it's, it's more or less transparent to light. Okay. And so we have a 50 ton uh, tank of water located about one kilometer uh, underground. Um, and so in 1987, it turns out that Kamiokande actually measured neutrinos from a supernova explosion, which is pretty cool. And that, in fact, confirmed the theory of supernova explosions and was sort of the, the dawn of neutrino astronomy. Here's a picture of uh, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory at SNO, SNO, sorry, SNO, S -N -O, uh, which is not so far away from, from MCU. Driving wise, and so in 2001, these were the first to, de 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 to demonstrate oscillations of these solar neutrinos, and this is 1,000 tons of heavy water. Uh, heavy water is deuterated water, where the hydrogen is is is, is, is our deuteron, and this is about two kilometers underground. So uh, I mentioned this that uh, there was a Nobel Prize in uh, 2015 that the neutrinos oscillate from the uh, the various heads of the laboratories. So in 2015, this was awarded to Takaki Kajita and, uh, from Tsubakamikande uh, and Arthur B. McDonald from Sudbury, Snow, uh, for the discovery of neutrino oscillations, which show that neutrinos have mass. If, if particles oscillate into each other, it's necessary that the, the masses are non-zero. So the, uh, this NOVA experiment NUMI off-axis neutrino uh, electron neutrino appearance experiment is designed to detect neutrinos from Fermilab. So here's Fermilab, uh, just outside of Chicago here. And so we have then a Minos far detector as well as a Nova far detector. And so they'll be looking at these uh, neutrino oscillations. Um, they'll be and they'll also be trying to measure then the this mixing angle, this theta one three mixing angle in the the p m n s uh, matrix as well as this, this phase. There are, there are these C, what are called a charge parity violating phases. We're not going to get into the details of this here. It's kind of complicated. Um, they're also trying to determine the, the uh, what's called a mass hierarchy. So from the, neutrino, the, the, the neutrino oscillations, you actually measure differences between um, the masses. Uh, but there's some question as to whether or not, so here are the masses increasing masses from, from zero to, to infinity here. Um, so they measure differences between uh, the, the masses, differences in actually the mass squares. And, but there's a question whether it looks like this or it looks like that. So this is what's called an inverted hierarchy, inverted, where the, the small gap is, is on top, and then there's something called a normal hierarchy. And uh, so, so it's actually not known which one, which one it is. And so they're trying to uh, use these experiments to try to pin down what these neutrino mass hierarchies, hierarchies look like. 
Now, I should also mention there are other um, interesting things going on related to what's called double beta decay. Right? So double beta decay can occur when um, single beta decay would end up have, uh, would produce, uh, uh, would, would, would go to a, a daughter nucleus that has less binding than the original one. Right? So you, you, that, that's not possible. Um, this would not be possible energetically. And so instead of going to single beta decay, what happens is you can have double beta decay where you produce two, uh, two process, uh, two two electrons and two anti-electron neutrinos. So of course this is even these are very very unlikely events, but uh, but if, if if this nucleus is stable except for this double beta decay, then this is something that you can see. So this has been seen in Castle 48, uh, Germanium 76, Lumium 82, uh, and so and so on. Okay, so y but you can see that the the half life is incredibly long. Right, so it's a very rare event. So it's typically on the order of about 10 to the 21 years. This is compared to 13.8 um, uh, billion years for the age of the universe. So you need a lot of this stuff before you see any of these double beta decays. Now, on top of this, there's something even more exotic. So we actually don't know if the neutrino is the same thing as the antineutrino. In other words, that they are uh, that, that um, this is what comes under the term uh, Majorana particle, that, um, that there's some difference between uh, whether or not there's a difference between the antineutrino and the neutrino. Okay? And so these Majorana particles are, are, th are, are a strange kind of particle where for the fermions that the, um, the, anti the, the antiparticles are the same thing as the regular particles. Right? Um, now, so, so all the other particles we, we know of are, have the Dirac property, um, where the antiparticles are different from the particles, but it could be for the neutrinos that they're the same. If that's the case, then you can have a very exotic version of double beta decay, where instead of producing the elect two electrons and two uh, anti-electron neutrinos, you could actually have no neutrinos being produced because they s sort of annihilate each other. Okay? In that case, you would only see two electrons coming out from this double beta decay. And so what that would do is, is when you see this, this, this distribution of, of, the, uh, of the energy, of the spectrum of the, of the two electrons, you would see this continuous spectrum for, for regular double beta decay, uh, sort of shown here, that's regular beta decay. But you could also have this event here where you only have two outgoing states, and so that ends up giving you uh, outgoing electrons, and they, that gives you a much sharper peak than in energy. Um, it's actually not that easy to see that. That makes it seem like it's, it's a really easy signal, but it's actually a small thing that, that, um, that you might be able to see. And there's a ton of experiments on trying to, to look at this. Here's one particular ex experiment, uh, the Xenon Observatory, which Xenon Observ Observatory, EXO200. Um, and so this is using uh, xenon-136, okay? And so they're, they're measuring them. They're, okay, so there's also recent experiments with uh, germanium-76. Uh, this is what's the Gerda experiment, as well as the xenon-136 from Camlan zen uh, and as well as, uh, uh, I, I just mentioned EXO. And so they're trying to pin down whether the, the, uh, this neutrino is, is this Majorana particle, where it's it's the same the anti the it's the same as its antiparticle, okay. and that's to be determined. Um, this we're still awaiting um, the the large scale experiments uh, where they have uh, lots and lots of these this uh, um, of xenon or germanium where they can try to detect uh, this neutrinoless double what's called neutrinoless double beta decay. The symbol is like this. It's written this way. Zero neutrino beta beta. Okay, so you need you need lots of this stuff. You need a, a many tons of, of uh, xenon or, or, or germanium to be able to measure this. And so here you can see a list of proposals. Um, so uh, I said there's a lot of effort in this direction uh, to, to try to measure neutrino double beta decay with various different collaborations. Um, there are people here at Michigan State involved in, in all this stuff. Now, I, I mentioned there was the normal hierarchy where the small gap is on the bottom, the big gap was on top. 
Um, you can also have uh, the case where, where the big gap is, uh, well, okay, so I, I drew this slightly wrong, but the big gap is, is to the top, to the, uh, from the very bottom to the very top, and then we have a small gap here, and this is what's called inverted hierarchy. So it turns out that it's this case that would be easier to see if the normal hierarchy would, uh, would make this double beta decay, neutrinos double beta decay, much more difficult. Um, so here is, for example, the mass limits as a function of years, right? So as you do different experiments, you're, you're probing um, the, these these masses of uh, the mass of the neut the mass of the neutrino. That's what you're measuring from from this neutrino double beta decay. And if we the, if the universe uh, is in this inverted hierarchy, then we can actually should be able to reach uh, the neutrino masses. Um, in you know not too not into the not too far future, if it's in the normal hierarchy, that band is is quite a bit lower, and so we would be kind of unlucky, um, and we would have to go much further to to see it. So people are hoping it's inverted so that we can see it sooner. All right. So so that's the end of the discussion of the weak interactions. Um, so please let me know if you have any questions via email. Thanks.